Hello everyone and welcome back to Time Critical Medical Education. Today a fascinating delve into the world of electrical storm and how knowledge about this condition can influence your management in the resuscitation room. Now from a definition perspective there is not a lot of worldwide consensus. The current agreed upon arbitrary definition is two to three or more separate VF or VT episodes in 24 hours which lead to either a shock or an ICD therapy constitutes an electrical storm. This is still controversial. Why is electrical storm relevant to critical care medicine? Well, the reason for that is, is because it's much commoner than it used to be. And the reason for that is because more people are getting implantable cardiac defibrillators. Up to a third of people with an ICD for a secondary cause get electrical storm and about 1 in 20, 1 in 25 people who had an ICD for primary prevention, like for example Brigada or WPW, have an electrical storm at some stage. It also matters because electrical storm is dangerous. Not surprisingly, it's an independent predictor of mortality. It's not clear yet whether it's the storm itself which causes ongoing damage or whether it's just a marker of severity of disease and progression. But the most important reason we should care about electrical storm is that the insights provided by recent advances into its pathophysiology can give us management options in the treatment of incredibly sick arrhythmia patients in our resuscitation room. Electrical storm is caused by either an underlying structural heart disease or an abnormal electrical substrate. Now it's helpful to delineate these two groups because as we'll see later, management can differ between the arrhythmias in each of these groups. Now, in the structural heart disease patients, by far the most common is ischemic heart disease, and we see arrhythmias both in the acutely ischemic and post-ischemic periods. But there's also lots of others, including the non-ischemic cardiomyopathies, like hokum, valvular heart disease, infiltrative disorders like sarcoidosis, and then the congenital heart disease, particularly the ones who've survived complex repairs. The a group of patients without structural heart disease have the abnormal electrical substrate, and this is where the underlying diagnosis becomes more interesting and important because it's commonly in these cases where the differential diagnosis can guide management. Now, in this group, we've got all the primary disorders such as Brigada or Long QT syndrome, and remember that I've got an entire talk on sudden cardiac death which goes through all of these disorders in detail with ECG recognition. And then you've got the secondary causes, which hopefully we're a bit better at picking up, like hypokalemia or toxic causes, endocrinopathies, or the post-operatives, or even R on T pacing. So the problem we have with managing electrical storm patients via standard ACLS pathways is that the management can differ depending on the underlying cause. So it's understanding the mechanisms behind electrical storm which allow you to direct treatment. An example might be deciding that the patient has Brigada and altering therapy drastically from adrenaline and shocks to isoprenaline. Now, obviously, the hard thing about being a first responder or a primary care provider in the emergency department is that while someone is arrested, trying to work out an underlying diagnosis can be difficult. Now, this is where using all of our skills comes into play. So we need to rapidly get someone off to try and find a bit of past medical history. That's a given. But we can also do things at the bedside to help. Obviously, the rhythm strip might be immediately helpful. We can tell the difference between VF and VT or even polymorphic VT or even a long QT polymorphic VT or bi bidirectional VT. If we get return of spontaneous circulation, we should do an ECG as soon as possible. All patients with electrical storm should get an immediate blood gas to rule out electrolyte disorders as a cause. And I think it's really important that critical care providers are trained in bedside echo because a POCUS ultrasound in this situation, diagnosing an underlying structural heart disease, could prove to be the difference between life or death in an electrical storm patient. So before we get into the individual causes and their management, I just want to touch on the recent pathophysiological advances from the literature. I've put references to a couple of terrific detailed articles at the end of this talk for those who want to delve in deep, but essentially most ventricular arrhythmias are triggered by after depolarizations. There's two main sorts, 
early and delayed. Now, the early group occur when there's a new inward sodium current occurring, usually during repolarization phase of the action potential, in the setting of a prolonged action potential. If you have a look at the diagram at the top of the page, it's the first picture there. And this often occurs in situations, for example, long QT, where repolarization phase of the AP is prolonged. The other group, which is far more common than early after depolarizations, are the delayed after depolarizations, or DADs. Now, a lot of recent work has shown that these are mediated by a calcium-dependent protein kinase 2 enzyme. This is potentiated by rising calcium concentrations, which come from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, having been promoted by cyclic AMP. The most important stimulators of this is either tachycardia or, very importantly, beta-sympathetic stimulation. So these little DADs, the bottom diagram on the screen, occur before the next action potential, and if they're strong enough, they cause a new inward sodium current and a new action potential. And if you're not familiar with some of the other key concepts, automaticity is the property of cardiac tissue to spontaneously depolarize. We know that all parts of the heart can do this, but it can be potentiated by various chemicals, drugs, or importantly again, beta-sympathetic stimulation. Re-entry is a very common pathway for loads of arrhythmias, and for this to occur, you need an abnormal substrate and you need some sort of trigger. And the trigger, for example, can be one of these early or delayed after depolarizations. So the most common group of electrical storm patients are those with monomorphic VT who have underlying structural heart disease. Usually, it's from re-entry where a myocardial scar provides the substrate, often initiated from focal ectopy from a delayed after depolarization, which, as we mentioned, is enhanced by beta-adrenergic activity. Now, common treatment in the past is a class 1 sodium channel blocker, but we know that sick ventricles don't like sodium channel blockers. So, amiodarone is used. It's still useful. It's in ILCOR. However, Given the role that we know about of the sympathetic promotion of these DADs, beta-1 blockade is quite important in secondary management. Now, we know from the electrical storm literature, if this is unsuccessful, heavy sedation, for example, intubating the patient and starting high-dose propofol and fentanyl can suppress sympathetic activity enough. And if that's unsuccessful, then radiofrequency catheter ablation can be the next step. Now, obviously, doing this during an arrest is not really feasible because you really need to do 3D mapping first to find the area of abnormal substrate. There is a significant major complication rate, but clearly this pales in comparison to permanent death from resistant VT. Now, these monomorphic VT structural heart disease patients are the ones most likely to have an automatic implantable cardiac defibrillator. And we know there's lots of evidence recently that patients with low ejection fractions, for example, are much more likely to develop VT and should have an ICD inserted. What you should know about the ICDs is they have an anti-tachycardia protocol built in, and this usually involves attempting on multiple occasions to overdrive pace the VT prior to delivering the internal shock. The reason for this is that evidence suggests that patients with frequent monomorphic VT do better long-term if they are overdrive-paced than if they are frequently shocked. It kind of makes sense. Monomorphic VT in structurally normal hearts is uncommon and is usually known as the idiopathic VTs, of which there's two main sorts. Outflow tract VT manifests itself on the ECG as a left bundle branch block pattern. The mechanism for outflow tract VT is cyclic AMP mediated delayed after depolarizations, which as we've already learned, are potentiated by beta sympathetic activity. So second line treatment for this outflow track VT is beta blockade. The most common group of idiopathic VT is known as fascicular VT. Most commonly, this originates in the posterior fascicle and when present there will give a narrowish right bundle branch block appearance on ECG. It's important to recognize because this Arrhythmia is also known as verapamil responsive VT because verapamil usually terminates it. Unlike the outflow track VT or other VTs, sympathetic stimulation is not the usual mechanism. It's very calcium dependent, so beta blockade is usually not successful. 
Radio frequency catheter ablation, although rarely needed, can be used in extreme situations. The second most common electrical storm is polymorphic VT or VF in underlying structural heart disease. Now, acutely, obviously, the treatment of choice is going to be revascularization. But if this is not successful, then in preference to class 1 agents, sympathetic ablation with beta blockade seems to be most successful. More extreme sympathetic blockade, such as a stellate ganglion block, has been used with success in resistant cases. If the patient has significant underlying heart failure, then it's thought that amiodarone, due to its effect on the inward KAS current, is the most appropriate treatment. The final group of patients are those with polymorphic VT or VF in a structurally normal heart. Now, these are the most interesting group to some extent, and if you're interested in the recognition of these underlying syndromes, please have a look at my sudden cardiac death talk. But for the purpose of this discussion, it's important to try and make a diagnosis because in this group, it's where management may differ the most between the individual arrhythmogenic disorders. Let's start with the long QT syndrome. Now, remember that polymorphic VT in the setting of long QT is known as torsade de pointe. It has congenital forms and acquired forms, and they differ in their management. The mechanism of polymorphic VT in the long QT syndrome is due to the early after depolarizations, which, as you know, occur on the back of a prolonged action potential. Now, we know that hypomag, hypo-K, hypocalcemia can cause a long QT, so we do need to investigate for and fix those as soon as possible. Magnesium is safe as a first-line treatment, but is not commonly effective in resistant torsade de pointe. In this setting, congenital long QT, beta blockade is the first-line treatment, with second line after that possibly being verapamil. Now, in the acquired long QT group, you shouldn't use beta blockade because it's the absolute QT here that is important. Beta blockade will cause bradycardia, prolonging the absolute QT. Treatment in the acquired long QT group is overdrive pacing, inducing a tachycardia and shortening the absolute QT interval. In polymorphic VT or VF due to the Brigada syndrome, which we should all recognize now, an electrical storm can be brought on by fever, hypokalemia, bradycardia, and high vagal tone. Now, the mechanism electrophysiologically for the VFVT is because of the loss of the action potential dome in the right ventricular epicardium. Now, this leads to the ST elevation pattern we see in the right ventricular precordial leads and re-entry. We know that class 1 agents can worsen this, hence the flecainide stimulation test for diagnosis, but some patients are treated successfully with quinidine. The treatment for electrical storm in Brigada is isoprenaline or isoprotenolol. And the reason for this is not necessarily because you're overdrive pacing the patient, it's because it reduces the ST elevation and recovers the action potential dome. And this is also the mechanism for why isoprenaline can help in VF due to the early repolarization syndrome. Another interesting arrhythmogenic syndrome is catecholaminergic polymorphic VT. Now, unfortunately, this has a normal baseline ECG, but luckily in the arrhythmia, you get a classic bidirectional VT, which alternates between a left and right bundle branch block pattern. Now, given its name, it's not surprising that the first line treatment is intravenous beta blocker. Second line is calcium channel blockers such as verapamil. And third line can be surgical sympathetic ablation. For idiopathic VF, Second line treatment has been studied and appears that verapamil may be the best in that situation. Now, if you're desperate in your electrical storm patient and nothing seems to be working, there is some limited support in the literature for trying to get the patient onto VA ECMO. This is predominantly used as a bridge to get the patient to a radio frequency catheter ablation or to a surgical sympathectomy. Sometimes it's useful in a toxic cause because drugs may have a limited effect due to half-life or clearance, and at times it can be used as a bridge to transplant in those patients with serious underlying heart disease. So to summarise what we've just talked about, I've put up this fantastic chart from Murray Yama's article in the Journal of Arrhythmia. The link appears a little bit later, but it is a really 
handy reference guide for the management of electrical storm based on mechanism. So the important take-home messages from this talk on electrical storm is that when normal treatment fails, for most causes of electrical storm, the treatment is going to be sympathetic blockade. The only time where this may not be the case is in Brigada and acquired long QT and in the rare case of a fascicular VT storm. So the question in my mind after going through the literature of electrical storm is does adrenaline still make sense? I've gone into this in a lot more detail in my next Tick Me Talk, Should Adrenaline Use Be Arrested? References for this talk are the amazing mechanistic management summary by Mariama, the very detailed investigation of pathophysiology by Suji et al., and thankfully a relatively simple overview by Gao and Sapp. Thank you once again for joining me on Time Critical Medical Education, and I really hope to see you again soon.